We are good to go. Look at that. Time to just right. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. I hope that as you are feeling the Spirit's presence with you, you can also extend the hand shake of peace to your friends and neighbors as we welcome each other to worship this morning. Please extend that welcome to your neighbors. I hope as you are getting settled back in your pews, you'll take a moment to pick up the Ritual of Friendship pad located on one of the ends of the pew to jot down your name and that you were with us in worship this morning. It's a great way for us to say hello to each other and to recognize that you're part of worship this morning. I do have a few announcements this morning as well. First, we would like to thank our pickup choir who will be joining us for their first Sunday this morning. Uh, singing a special song during the offertory. So if this is something you'd like to be part of this low commitment during the summer, they come about 10.30, correct Jeremy, on Sunday mornings to learn a beautiful musical number. Um, today they'll be offering it during the offertory and that is just something we can join in joyful music together. And Jeremy, I know, would love for you to be part of this as they continue through um, the rest of the summer. Also, we'd like to extend a thank you to our soup kitchen folks who served yesterday evening. Um, I was told they, have, they had 85 thirst th first through, and they served over 135 plates to complete that service. So clearly that is something of need in our community, and I was told, of course, you need to know what they ate, because we always need to know that. They had uh, sandwiches, baked beans, and coleslaw. So we'd like to extend our thank yous to uh, Denise Cole, Kim Zimmerman, Ross Ann Gorski, Andy Vogue, the Knapps, the Martin family, and the Henrys for heading that all up. So thank you to all for that great service. Appreciate your help. And if this kind of announcement itches something inside of you and you'd like to serve as well, we do have dates open in August. Please check the board downstairs or call the church office. That is, is something we are so thankful to be part of serving this for our community, and we would love to continue in that. Finally, we extend a prayers and thanks for um, Emily and our youth who headed out to the Montreat Youth Conference yesterday morning, bright and bushy-tailed at 5.30. So <laughs> they headed out yesterday morning um, for a great week of faith development and worship um, it's something they look forward to every summer, and as one who has been a part of that in other spaces um, and helped last summer, it's always amazing to me that they come back so renewed and loving of worship. And if you ever hear parts of what they do, it is a worship just like this, but there's a lot more movement, and hopefully they will share what that looks like with us um, in August during Youth Sunday. We also extend traveling mercies for Steve and Teresa as they are spending time with Emmett up in Atlanta, and they hopefully will return to us soon and enjoying this summer vacation. I believe that is all the major updates I have for this morning. And before we continue in worship, it is Three Cents a Meal Sunday is our third Sunday. And so I invite our three penny partners to come join me down front as we collect that hunger offering. <laughs>
with signs of such generosity. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. God will speak peace. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear the Lord, and God's glory will dwell in our land. Let us worship together, confident of that promise. Let us continue to worship God as we sing together hymn 300. We are one in the spirit, and as always, the words will be up on the screens. You can also find this in your hymnal. Please stand if you are able.
ask a question. How long? How long will we live unjustly and show partiality instead of loving as God has loved us? Trusting in that love, let us now confess our transgressions to the Lord. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have been distracted with many things and have not loved you with our whole heart and strength. We have not paid attention to your word. We have allowed the poor to be neglected and the weak to be oppressed. We have been impatient in worship and insincere in our dealing with others. Forgive us, we pray, and teach us repentance. Free us from our habits of pride and make us steadfast in faith that we may live as those who are reconciled with you in Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom we pray. We lift all of these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ is merciful to all who turn to him in repentance. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, it's just this simple. All that we have is a gift from God. In gratitude for all that God has done for us, let us now present our gifts to God. So whether that's online or in the plates being passed here in the sanctuary, let us return to God a portion of what we have so generously been blessed with.
Let us pray. O God, receive these gifts, which are the product of our labors, and let us not forget the better part of our offering, which is our devotion to the words of life we have received from Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite our youngest disciples to join me down front for a delightful children's story. Good morning, friends. I'm so excited, with you, excited to share with you the good news for all God's children. Book for this morning called Swaspy and the Sea. So let's join him. It begins like this. Captain Swaspy loved the sea. The sea and he had been friends for a long time long time. She knew him in and out, up and down, and better than anyone. So when Schwasby retired, it was to a small house on a small beach as close to the sea as he could be. Whenever he needs, needed something, the sea provided exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. Life was just the way Schwaspy liked it. Salty and sandy and serene until squeaks and squeals sprang from the empty house next door, which was no longer empty. It had been commandeered by a girl and her granny who planted umbrellas, scattered beach chairs, and boarded Schwaspy's deck without permission. Oh, awful. Poor Schwaspy. Schwaspy battened down the hatches, hid when the doorbell rang, and fed their oatmeal cookies to the gulls. He didn't need neighbors. He didn't want neighbors. Neighbors were noisy, a nuisance, annoying. So, in return, he left a message written clearly in the sand. No trespassing, which the sea fiddled with just a little bit. Sing, the little girl read, and did just that. She sang every song she knew while dancing up and down Schwaspy's deck. What now, she asked. Now vanish, Swaspy wrote later that evening, adding a starfish exclamation point. And the sea fiddled just a bit. Wish, the little girl read, picking up the starfish, and did just that. She closed her eyes and began I wish. No, 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 watched me interrupted, stomping down the steps. If you want, if you mean to make a starfish wish, you must say this. Starfish back to the waves so blue, the sea will see a wish come true. How lovely, Granny said. We'd wish you'd come for a cup of tea, Mr. Swashby.
but Swatby wished to be left alone. So he grumbled and mumbled and hurried inside. He didn't need tea. He didn't want tea. Tea was civilized, friendly, neighborly. What he needed was a new message. Please go away, he wrote firmly in the sand. And again, the sea fiddled just a little. Play, the little girl sounded out and did just that. With swaspies, shells and stones, with his buckets and shovels. But her towers kept falling. Barnacle bottoms, Swaspie mumbled, marching out. You doing it all wrong. You must not use the sun-baked sand. It's the sea sand does the trick. And he showed her how to dig for the wet sand below. Then, but Swaspie was gone. Before long, amazing sculptures decorated the beach. It's the clam salad you should be using, Swashby called from inside. Come play, Mr. Swashby, the girl called back. Swashby, don't play, he answered, banging the shutters. So the sea decided to meddle more than just a little. She inched her way up the sand and tickled the girl's toes. She nibbled the sculptures and slurped away the bucket. The girl tried to grab it, but look, look at me, the girl called. Look at her, Granny gasped. Oh dear, look at her. Granny hurried to the water's edge, but Swashby was already there. What are you up to, you salty imp? He asked, scooping up the girl and the bucket. With a great big wave, the sea delivered the pair back to the shore. And there was no stopping the laughing and thanking and hugging that was Swaspie's reward. I see what you did, he whispered to the sea as he was whisked away to celebrate. After that, it was easy for Swaspie to have tea with the girl and her granny and ice cream, and lobster, and s'mores on the beach. <laughs> it was easy for him to share his special sea glass. It was even easy for him to see that neighbors could be fun, and friends, and family. And when he had a moment to himself, Swaspy carved a heartfelt message for the sea. Thank you, friend, which the sea fiddled with just a little bit. <laughs> the end. So we met someone on the seashore and the little girl made a new friend. I hope that you have taken some time this summer to enjoy the seashore and maybe made some new friends. And we will see how this connects for all of us in a little bit. I hope, let us spend, let's close our time in prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for allowing us to be reminded of your great love for us in friends and family in this summertime as we enjoy time together on the seashore and inviting new people into our lives. 
May we see Christ in them. It is in his powerful name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you later. Friends, let us now join together in offering our prayers, both for our church, our church family, and for the world. Let us pray together. Creator God, as we look at the world you have made, we notice that the songs of love that you wanted us to sing have turned into cries of abuse and oppression. We have abused the planet that you have provided for us to inhabit and to share with other creatures. We've wasted the water, abused other resources, limited access to food, and marked borders of inhospitality. Loving God, we pray for this world in need of restoration and ask that you provide us with the tools and the intelligence needed to rebuild the world you created for us. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. God, there is oppression in the world that we live in. We see it in the ways human beings treat one another taking advantage of those considered to be of less value. We sometimes turn our eyes away when we see the needy being trampled or the poor being stashed out of sight. May your will be the last word and the church an effective witness to the sovereign Lord in our midst. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. We see prejudice in our relationships, Lord. We judge one another not with justice and fairness, but with fear and misinformation. It's easier to demonize than to take the time to listen and to establish relationships. It's easier to assume than to ask questions and to acquire knowledge. So God, we pray that you make us agents of peace and restore our songs of love for you and for one another. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. Merciful God, we lift up all those in our community of faith who are traveling this summer, those on vacations, those visiting family. We lift up our youth and leaders who are away, growing in their faith at Montreat. We pray for traveling mercies and for your steadfast hand to guard and protect them all. Great healer, we lift up those in our midst who are sick, who struggle with pain, those who await test results and news from doctors. We pray for your mercy, for your presence, and for your peace. Lord, we ask that you guide us in this coming week to be your instruments, sharing your life-giving love with all we encounter. Empower us to be your people and follow you and your word without reservation. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. For so many blessings and for answered prayers, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. Listen now to God's word to us this morning as it begins. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Marmi, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourself under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. 
So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quick three measures of choice flour, knead it, make cakes, ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And they stood by him under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you and do season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The word of the Lord. Ah, this familiar story. One I distinctly remember from my first preaching class in seminary. This is the text of one of my very first sermons. And I remember the time and anxiety of trying to get it just right, preparing that first sermon, painstakingly researching and reading, exploring commentaries and resources on Genesis and this Abrahamic covenant. And I remember being so excited to share my hook, that connection between the Old Testament story and today. I was ready. I was so excited to share it with my class. And I remember standing in that basement chapel, fiddling with the sleeves of my sweaters, playing and messing with my hair, my papers, getting all ready. I was going to share the word. And the best part, y'all, I found the recording of it. (laughs) That's right, there's going to be a VHS video showing for you right now. You ready for the word? All right, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I brought this up and remembering it, not because my first sermon was amazing and I got it right the first time, no problem, great, I was natural, no. This text and the memories around my first sermon come to mind because of how my preaching instructor critiqued what I had to say. Where I thought the centrality of this sermon was about the naming, the human decision of Sarah to name her first child about laughter, Isaac, a pun on that Hebrew word for laughter. And I focused on our decisions and the importance of naming and that designation of how we use names to tell of a history, a past, a present, and the possibilities of future. No, I had missed it. Maybe that's why I was in a preaching class to begin with, the focus of this story. I was so focused on what the people were doing that I missed that main character, the one sitting in the midst of two other visitors, God and just what God exactly was up to with those two people in the desert. God, fiddle. It's right there in the center of the narrative, in verse 18, as the visitors become one. The one asks the question of Sarah, is there anything 
too wonderful for the Lord. Here is the key to that narrative. Here is the key to our story. It is about what God does and is capable of doing. That's what stuck with me. Because we have been in this reading of Genesis, the long saga, the beginning of these people gathered as and promised to God. This long promise and saga began between God and Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai, in chapter 12 of Genesis. The very first Abrahamic covenant is announced by God in verse 1. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And yet they continued in their journey across nations, aging in ways that they were, of course, expected. They prospered, they failed, and the covenant is announced again by God in chapter 13 and 15, as God tells Abraham to look to the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them, and so shall your descendants be. And he tells Abraham again in chapter 17 of how Sarai becomes Sarah, the mother of a nation. Kings and peoples will come from her. And yet, there is nothing. The Abraham and Sarah we meet in chapter 18 has been reminded again and again of this promise of a land, of a people, of God's presence with them. And yet, it has not happened. Here in chapter 18, we, in these very verses, we get just a small inkling of what Sarah thought of all these crazy dreams these grandiose ideas and promises that have been yet to be realized. And her first response, as Sarah listened from inside of a tent, is laughter. Some Bible translated, as we have just read, that she laughed to herself. Other possible translations could be that she laughed in the very middle of her belly, you feel it down there, maybe even from her womb, all denoting this private moment of a woman who, as one commentary notes, that in this story we have a powerful example of where humanity often finds itself when it sits in the presence of God we are in a place of laughter. Not the laughter of joy and happiness, but the laughter of disbelief and astonishment. Why did Sarah laugh? Because it is what humans do when faced with the possibility of more than what our limited minds can grasp. We often know no other way to be in those circumstances. We are incredulous with our laughter, unwilling or unable to accept the idea that God might actually be accomplishing what God had promised. So how else did you respond to those dreamers in your life? Those moments when those dreams bubble up of, ha, no way, that can't be true. That can't be possible, God. 
these peoples that seem to have hopes and dreams that lead them into new places, new jobs, new possibilities, going back to school, or traveling over the horizons to new places, or learning something new. Maybe we respond like Sarah when we hear those big dreams, but our reality is like the desert that Abraham and Sarah sat in. We sit in lands of dry, scorched earth, hot and empty around us. Or maybe we're perfectly content to sit alone on the seaside did you notice in our book this morning the name of Swasby's boat? El Recluso. So the day to day tasks take over the doctor's appointments, the grocery lists, laundry and bills, and care for others that you're able to put that dream deep down, a, pill, a pee sitting uncomfortably between the cushions at the end of the day. And maybe you too have sat down serene and isolated, perfectly content where you are on the salty sands. Then unexpected visitors arrive. Because sometimes when we read these kinds of stories, we see God as so big, so other, so uninterested in human affairs that maybe we don't recognize when God shows up. Or maybe we see, like in other parts of Scripture, as one Jewish historian summarizes it, this story this way. Elsewhere in the Torah, God is shown to be wrathful and punishing and human beings are shown to cringe and cower in the fear of him. And for good reason, too. God is perfectly capable of scrouging and even killing men and women who are not sufficiently compliant and deferential. But at this moment of his tet-for-tat -tat with Sarah, all of our expectations about who God is and what God wants of us is tweaked. Sarah is so unafraid of the Almighty that she laughs at his words and then lies to his face. The all-knowing and all-seeing God of Israel is so taken aback that God is forced to ask why as she's laughing at his solemn promise. For all of her audacity and boldness, God responds only with, a, with petulance rather than punishing wrath. And as if to symbolize how little God fears the Lord, how little Sarah fears God, the child she bears in the fulfillment of that promise is Yitzhak, Isaac. I laughed, a pun in the Hebrew of the word laughter. The very miracle announced in this passage speaks of a God whose mighty power to act in the most hopeless situations. A God who took Sarah's disbelief, doubts, lies, and even that physical reality of a barren woman whose hope for a child was as dry as the desert in which they had lived to something amazing, something wonderful, something spoken to by God himself in that verse, that key, is anything too wonderful for the Lord. And so that question I hope lingers for you, that question that dare speaks of life and speaks to life, of unspoken dreams, those long buried hopes, those glimmers of God's kingdom just out of your sight line. 
as we have been so focused and wrapped up on what the humans are doing, not doing, should be doing, we miss the invitation to what God is already up to. We become Abraham, running around doing and ordering and preparing that we miss that experience of the recognition in joining in God's redemptive work in the world. So, may this morning be an invitation for you to pause, to see what God is doing, maybe put on a different set of glasses and perceive what God's promises may be asking of you, fiddling with you. Maybe it's an opening up to new relationships, as that is who God is. Seeking relationships since the very beginning. When we focus on what Adam and Eve were up to in that garden, we, mo we miss that the Lord is walking, seeking to be, just be with them in the dusk. Take a moment. Rest in that relationship. It's okay to even allow a laughter to bubble up because we are reminded in that larger narrative of faith that we belong to a God who makes promises. Where in moments we may see only the desert and its barrenness, or maybe we are sitting alone on that sandy seashore. God fiddles. God questions where we thought we were and promises as an oath that gives faith power to survive and even prosper in demanding and debilitating circumstances. It is concrete and specific one that is handed to the next generation. One, a promise able trans to transform barrenness into circumstances of possibility, well-being, and maybe even joy. So I hope in that next moment of your life, this next moment of your life, you too are able to sit and open yourselves to that possibility of God fiddling. Maybe just one more time with you too. May that laughter bubble up. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us continue in that worship as we sing together our next hymn, our final hymn. Hymn 100, my, my soul cries out with a joyful shout. Please stand as you are comfortable and able.
as you go from this place and go back out into the world, may you be assured that the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness will indeed meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Go in peace. Confident in the promises of God are indeed moments, moments that start with laughter. May the grace of our Christ, our Lord, attend to you. The love of God surround you and the Holy Spirit keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.